If he gets up, we'll all get up. It'll be anarchy. The Anarcho-Christian Podcast, evaluating the relationship between the Christian and the state. Give us a king to rule us when you're gone. His life's work had been to help the people understand. It's not the role of a man to rule over other men. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. So one of my favorite lines from a movie is from Judd Nelson in The Breakfast Club. It'll be anarchy! It is such a funny caricature of anarchy, and it is what most people imagine when they think of anarchy. Just complete chaos. Another common anarchy movie trope is Mad Max. It's a dystopian story of a man trying to survive in the Australian outback as he encounters ruthless warlords, roving gangs, and an extreme lack of resources. I am gravely disappointed. Again, you have made me unleash my dogs of war. This sort of perception of anarchy is everywhere in entertainment. Where Mad Max may be the go-to anarchy movie example, there is a very prominent literary example. I'm not sure about today, but when I was in high school, I had to read The Lord of the Flies. Again, I'm not sure about today, but I know that for a while it was mandatory reading in public school. So, by now, we've had at least one generation that was forced to read this book. And even if it's not still mandatory reading in school, it's been enshrined in many must-read reading lists. But probably the pinnacle of success for this novel is the author, William Golding, receiving the Nobel Prize in 1983, as the announcement cites, for his novels which, with perspicuity of realistic narrative art, and the diversity and the universality of myth, illuminate the human condition in the world today. So what is this human condition that he's illuminated? For anyone that's familiar with The Lord of the Flies, the human condition is necessarily tragic. For anyone familiar with the rhetoric surrounding The Lord of the Flies, the human condition is undoubtedly chaotic, insane, and murderous. In a word, it's anarchy. For those that aren't familiar with the book, I'll go over a brief description. Here is the Goodreads blurb. At the dawn of the next world war, a plane crashes on an uncharted island, stranding a group of schoolboys. At first, with no adult supervision, their freedom is something to celebrate. This far from civilization, the boys can do anything they want. Anything. They attempt to forge their own society, failing, however, in the face of terror, sin, and evil. And as order collapses, as strange howls echo in the night, as terror begins its reign, the hope of adventure seems as far from reality as the hope of being rescued. Labeled a parable, an allegory, a myth, a morality tale, a parody, a political treatise, even a vision of the apocalypse, Lord of the Flies is perhaps our most memorable novel about the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart. At this point, I want to go over a couple of aspects of the book that don't quite line up with the rhetoric or the blurb, and warning, spoilers ahead. The pivotal point is this idea of order collapsing. It's because when the kids gather themselves together, they quickly vote in a leader, which is democracy, by the way, a form of government, not anarchy. But it doesn't last. During the boys' stay on the island, one of the other boys decides to break off with his own posse. 
When this happens, it quickly sets into motion the chaos, which eventually leads to the murder of multiple boys. But what they are calling the collapse of order isn't really an example of anarchy. Now, we've gone over the correct definition of anarchy a few times on the show, which is simply being without a ruler. But this time, we need to look a little closer into this idea of government. Because what happens here is not an absence of a ruler. It's a competition between rulers and between their two different systems. It's not a breakdown of order to disorder. It's more of a changing of the guard. It's a short jump from one government to another kind. But maybe I need to back up. If anarchy is the absence of government, maybe we should be more specific in defining what is government. My go-to definition is that of Murray Rothbard in his excellent short book, The Anatomy of the State. Rothbard writes, Briefly, the state is that organization in society which attempts to maintain a monopoly of the use of force and violence in a given territorial area. In particular, it is the only organization in society that obtains its revenue not by voluntary contribution or payment for services rendered, but by coercion. While there may be no revenue in this tale, the use of violence for control is a central point to this part of the story. So what we have here isn't the chaos of government breaking down or the absence of government, it's the chaos of competing governments. In the novel, it plays out with the formation of a second tribe and the war that follows. In reality, it plays out with the endless wars that are not a result of a lack of government, but wars between governments. And in a similar point between the fiction and reality, it is the strongest that survives. The government that is willing to use the most violence, the one that will make the other government submit, is the winner. With all of that considered, are we really seeing anarchy portrayed in The Lord of the Flies? Are we actually seeing an absence of government? No. We see the kids quickly and naturally voting for a leader, which is the now sacred practice of democracy and then another strong man rising up to challenge that democracy and ruling through populism and fear, threats, and promises. Okay, I hope that shows a little different perspective on The Lord of the Flies. I think when we look at the basic concepts outside of the established narrative, we see that it isn't about anarchy at all, but about the murderous chaos that happens between competing government organizations. The next concept that surrounds Lord of the Flies is this idea of the inevitability of these events. The inherent chaos of individuals without a government to control them. But is this how it would really go down? The general message and takeaway of the novel is that yes, this is inevitable. This is what will happen. But did you know there's a real life story that very closely parallels the Lord of the Flies, but has a drastically different outcome? About 15 years after the publishing of The Lord of the Flies, a real group of boys were stranded on an island for a long period of time. I'd like to read over a popular article on that event, and let's keep in mind the details of The Lord of the Flies that we've already brought up as we go over it. The article is titled, The Real Lord of the Flies. What happened when six boys were shipwrecked for 15 months? It was published in The Guardian on May 9th, 2020, and written by Rutger Bergman. So without further delay, let's jump into it. For centuries, Western culture has been permeated by the idea that humans are selfish creatures. That cynical image of humanity has been proclaimed in films and novels, history books, and scientific research. But in the last 20 years, something extraordinary has happened. 
scientists from all over the world have switched to a more hopeful view of mankind. This development is still so young that researchers in different fields often don't even know about each other. When I started writing a book about this more hopeful view, I knew there was one story I would have to address. It takes place on a deserted island somewhere in the Pacific. A plane has just gone down. The only survivors were some British schoolboys, who can't believe their good fortune. Nothing but beach, shells, and water for miles. And better yet, no grown-ups. On the very first day, the boys institute a democracy of sorts. One boy, Ralph, is elected to be the group's leader. Athletic, charismatic, and handsome. His game plan is simple. One, have fun. Two, survive. Three, make smoke signals for passing ships. Number one is a success. The others, not so much. The boys are more interested in feasting and frolicking than in tending the fire. Before long, they have begun painting their faces, casting off their clothes, and they develop overpowering urges to pinch, to kick, to bite. By the time a British naval officer comes ashore, the island is a smoldering wasteland. Three of the children are dead. I should have thought, the officer says, that a pack of British boys would have been able to put up a better show than that. At this, Ralph burst into tears. Ralph wept for the end of innocence, we read, and for the darkness of man's heart. This story never happened. An English schoolmaster, William Golding, made up this story in 1951. His novel, Lord of the Flies, would sell tens of millions of copies, be translated into more than 30 languages, and hailed as one of the classics of the 20th century. In hindsight, the secret of the book's success is clear. Golding had a masterful ability to portray the darkest depths of mankind. Of course, he had the zeitgeist of the 1960s on his side, when a new generation was questioning its parents about the atrocities of the Second World War. Had Auschwitz been an anomaly? They wanted to know. Or is there a Nazi hiding in each of us? I first read Lord of the Flies as a teenager. I remember feeling disillusioned afterwards, but not for a second did I think to doubt Golding's view of human nature. That didn't happen until years later when I began delving into the author's life. I learned what an unhappy individual he had been, an alcoholic prone to depression. I have always understood the Nazis, Golding confessed, because I am of that sort by nature. And it was partly out of the sad self-knowledge that he wrote Lord of the Flies. I began to wonder, had anyone ever studied what real children would do if they found themselves alone on a deserted island? I wrote an article on the subject in which I compared Lord of the Flies to modern scientific insights and concluded that, in all probability, kids would act very differently. Readers responded skeptically. All my examples concerned kids at home, at school, or at summer camp. Thus began my quest for a real-life Lord of the Flies. After trawling the web for a while, I came across an obscure blog that told an arresting story. One day, in 1977, six boys set out from Tonga on a fishing trip. Caught in a huge storm, the boys were shipwrecked on a deserted island. What did they do, this little tribe? They made a pact never to quarrel. The article did not provide any sources, but sometimes all it takes is a stroke of luck. Sifting through a newspaper article one day, I typed a year incorrectly, and there it was. The reference to 1977 turned out to have been a typo. In the October 6, 1966 edition of Australian newspaper The Age, a headline jumped out at me. Sunday showing for Tongan castaways. The story concerned six boys who had been found three weeks earlier on a rocky islet south of Tonga, an island group in the Pacific Ocean. The boys had been rescued by an Australian sea captain after being marooned on the island of Ata for more than a year. According to the article, the captain had even got a television station to film a reenactment of the boys' adventure. I was bursting with questions. Were the boys still alive? And could I find the television footage? Most importantly, though, I had a lead. The captain's name was Peter Warner. 
When I searched for him, I had another stroke of luck. In a recent issue of a tiny local paper from McKay, Australia, I came across the headline, Mates Share 50-Year Bond. Printed alongside was a small photograph of two men, smiling, one with his arm slung around the other. The article began, Deep in a banana plantation at Tolera, near Lismore, sit an unlikely pair of mates. The elder is 83 years old, the son of a wealthy industrialist. The younger, 67, was literally a child of nature. Their names? Peter Warner and Wano Total. And where had they met? On a deserted island. My wife and I rented a car in Brisbane and some three hours later arrived at our destination, a spot in the middle of nowhere that stumped Google Maps. Yet, there he was, sitting out in front of a low-slung house off the dirt road, the man who rescued six lost boys 50 years ago, Captain Peter Warner. Peter was the youngest son of Arthur Warner, once one of the richest and most powerful men in Australia. Back in the 1930s, Arthur ruled over a vast empire called Electronic Industries, which dominated the country's radio market at the time. Peter was groomed to follow in his father's footsteps. Instead, at the age of 17, he ran away to sea in search of adventure and spent the next years sailing from Hong Kong to Stockholm, Shanghai to St. Petersburg. When he finally returned five years later, the prodigal son proudly presented his father with a Swedish captain's certificate. Unimpressed, Warner Sr. demanded his son learn a useful profession. What's easiest? Peter asked. Accountancy, Arthur lied. Peter went to work for his father's company, yet the sea still beckoned, and whenever he could, he went to Tasmania, where he kept his own fishing fleet. It was this that brought him to Tonga in the winter of 1966. On the way home, he took a little detour, and that's when he saw it, a minuscule island in the Azure Sea, Atta. The island had been inhabited once, until one dark day in 1863, when a slave ship appeared on the horizon and sailed off with the natives. Since then, Atta had been deserted, cursed, and forgotten. But Peter noticed something odd. Peering through his binoculars, he saw burned patches on the green cliffs. In the tropics, it's unusual for fires to start spontaneously, he told us a half century later. When he saw a boy, naked, hair down to his shoulders, this wild creature leaped from the cliffside and plunged into the water. Suddenly, more boys followed screaming at the tops of their lungs. It didn't take long for the first boy to reach the boat. My name is Stephen, he cried in perfect English. There are six of us, and we reckon we've been here 15 months. The boys, once aboard, claimed they were students at the boarding school in Nuku'alafa, the Tongan capital. Sick of school meals, they had decided to take a fishing boat out one day, only to get caught in a storm. Likely story, Peter thought. Using his two-way radio, he called into Nuku'alafa. I've got six kids here, he told the operator. Stand by, came the response. Twenty minutes ticked by. As Peter tells his part of the story, he gets a little misty-eyed. Finally, a very tearful operator came on the radio and said, You found them. These boys have been given up for dead. Funerals have been held. If it's them, this is a miracle. In the months that followed, I tried to reconstruct as precisely as possible what had happened on Atta. Peter's memory turned out to be excellent. Even at the age of 90, everything he recounted was consistent with my foremost other source, Mano, 15 years old at the time and now pushing 70, who lived just a few hours' drive from him. The real Lord of the Flies began in June 1965. The protagonists were six boys. Sion, Stephen, Kolo, David, Luke, Mano. All pupils at a strict Catholic boarding school in Nuku'alafa. The oldest was 16, the youngest 13, and they had one main thing in common. 
they were bored witless. So they came up with a plan to escape, to Fiji, some 500 miles away, or even all the way to New Zealand. There was only one obstacle. None of them owned a boat. So they decided to borrow one from a fisherman they all disliked. The boys took little time to prepare for the voyage. Two sacks of bananas, a few coconuts, and a small gas burner were all the supplies they packed. It didn't occur to any of them to bring a map, let alone a compass. No one noticed the small craft leaving the harbor that evening. Skies were fair, only a mild breeze roughed the calm sea. But that night, the boys made a grave error. They fell asleep. A few hours later, they awoke to water crashing down over their heads. It was dark. They hoisted the sail, which the wind promptly tore to shreds. Next to break was the rudder. We drifted for eight days, Mono told me, without food, without water. The boys tried catching fish. They managed to collect some rainwater and hollowed out coconut shells and shared it equally between them, each taking a sip in the morning and another in the evening. Then, on the eighth day, they spied a miracle on the horizon. A small island, to be precise. Not a tropical paradise with waving palm trees and sandy beaches, but a hulking mass of rock jutting up more than a thousand feet out of the ocean. These days, Ata is considered uninhabitable. But by the time we arrived, Captain Warner wrote in his memoirs, the boys had set up a small commune with a food garden, hollowed out tree trunks to store rainwater, a gymnasium with curious weights, a badminton court, chicken pens, and a permanent fire, all from handiwork, an old knife blade, and much determination. While the boys in Lord of the Flies come to blows over the fire, those in the real-life version tended their flame so it never went out for more than a year. The kids agreed to work in teams of two, drawing up a strict roster for garden, kitchen, and guard duty. Sometimes they quarreled, but whenever that happened, they solved it by imposing a timeout. Their days began and ended with song and prayer. Kolo fashioned a makeshift guitar from a piece of driftwood, half a coconut shell, and six steel wires salvaged from their wrecked boat. An instrument Peter has kept all these years and played it to lift their spirits. And their spirits needed lifting. All summer long, it hardly rained, driving the boys frantic with thirst. They tried constructing a raft in order to leave the island, but it fell apart in the crashing surf. Worst of all, Stephen slipped one day, fell off of a cliff, and broke his leg. The other boys picked their way down after him and then helped him back up to the top. They set his leg using sticks and leaves. Don't worry, Sion joked. We'll do the work while you lie here like King Tupo himself. They survived initially on fish, coconuts, tame birds. They drank the blood as well as eating the meat. And seabird eggs were sucked dry. Later. When they got to the top of the island, they found an ancient volcanic crater, where people had lived a century before. There the boys discovered wild taro, bananas, and chickens, which had been reproducing for the 100 years since the last Tongans had left. They were finally rescued on Sunday, September 11, 1966. The local physician later expressed astonishment at their muscled physiques and Stephen's perfectly healed leg. But this wasn't the end of the boys' little adventure, because when they arrived back in Nuko Alafa, police boarded Peter's boat, arrested the boys, and threw them in jail. The fisherman, whose sailing boat the boys had borrowed 15 months earlier, was still furious, and he decided to press charges. Fortunately for the boys, Peter came up with a plan. It occurred to him that the story of their shipwreck was perfect Hollywood material. And being his father's corporate accountant, Peter managed the company's film rights and new people in TV. So from Tonga, he called up the manager of Channel 7 in Sydney. You can have the Australian rights, he told them. Give me the world rights. Next, Peter paid the fisherman 150 pounds for his old boat and got the boys released on condition that they would cooperate with the movie. 
A few days later, a team from Channel 7 arrived. The mood when the boys returned to their families in Tonga was jubilant. Almost the entire island, population 900, had turned out to welcome them home. Peter was proclaimed a national hero. Soon he received a message from King Tupo IV himself, inviting the captain for an audience. Thank you for rescuing six of my subjects, His Royal Highness said. Now is there anything I can do for you? The captain didn't have to think long. Yes, I would like to trap lobster in these waters and start a business here. The king consented. Peter returned to Sydney, resigned from his father's company, and commissioned a new ship. Then he had the six boys brought over and granted them the thing that had started it all, an opportunity to see the world beyond Tonga. He hired them as the crew of his new fishing boat. While the boys of Ada have been consigned to obscurity, Golding's book is still widely read. Media historians even credit him as being the unwitting originator of one of the most popular entertainment genres on television today, reality TV. I read and reread Lord of the Flies, divulged the creator of the hit series Survivor in an interview. It's time we told a different kind of story. The real Lord of the Flies is a tale of friendship and loyalty, one that illustrates how much stronger we are if we can lean on each other. After my wife took Peter's picture, he turned to a cabinet and rummaged around for a bit, then drew out a heavy stack of papers that he laid in my hands. His memoirs, he explained, written for his children and grandchildren. I looked down at the first page. Life has taught me a great deal, it began, including the lesson that you should always look for what is good and positive in people. Well, I hope you like that story, and its contrast to the book The Lord of the Flies. It really just comes down to presumptions and propaganda. Anarchy doesn't mean chaos, and chaos isn't inevitable without a coercive governing body with a monopoly on violence. In the audiobook preface to The Lord of the Flies, author William Golding said his book is about the problem of evil, and the problem of how people are to live together in society. He said when he wrote it that he was wondering what would happen if boys were portrayed as they are, rather than saints. There have been a great many things said about how it came to be written, and I don't know whether any of them are true or not. As far as I'm concerned... It happened because one day I was sitting one side of the fireplace and my wife was sitting the other, and I suddenly said to her, wouldn't it be a good idea to write a story about some boys on an island showing how they would really behave, being boys and not little saints as they usually are in children's books. And the other picture was of this same little boy crying crying his heart out, more or less, because he discovered what actually went on, what people were like in society when you don't have law. I, I think, really, perhaps you could say the most important thing said in the book is when um, Jack says bollocks to the rules, why should we obey the rules, and um, why should we bother about the rules, and, and um, Ralph says, because the rules are the only thing we've got. That really is, I suppose you could say, what the book is about. If you don't have rules, that is to say, if you don't have law, then you're lost, you're finished, you're gone. With that said, I think we can see exactly what Golding thinks of the natural inclination of boys and society. This falls under some of the fallacies we've gone over on this show before. It's an assumption that people are naturally inclined toward evil, so we need an organization of people to restrain them. Of course, this omits the irony that we need evil men to stop evil men. We shouldn't forget that people don't somehow become righteous or lose their self-interest once they form a governing organization. Historically, 
we can show that it is under government that the most catastrophic and deadly events in human history have occurred, and often under the guise of the righteousness and necessity of government. We saw how the Lord of the Flies is challenged in reality. And we have seen in the author's own words that he was challenging the existing perceptions of boys and their natural inclinations. In literature, I've seen several attempts to counter a narrative that said boys, or people in general, are drawn to honor and other virtues. And then that reminds me of one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, and that Golding's points seem like a direct counter to his narratives. No doubt anyone listening is somewhat familiar with C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. In it, we see a drastically different perception of children. Though it's not from the Narnia series, one of my favorite Lewis quotes cast a different context and narrative altogether from Golding's Lord of the Flies. Lewis says, Since it is so likely that children will meet cruel enemies, let them at least have heard of brave knights and heroic courage. Otherwise, you are making their destiny not brighter, but darker. Lord of the Flies tells of a dark destiny for children, a bleak fatalism that seems to show that boys themselves are their own cruel enemy. I agree with Lewis, and I think it's important for children to hear stories of bravery, virtue, and courage. So it begs the question, if Lewis is right, and the tales of bravery and courage makes for a brighter destiny, what do we think we are creating when we mandate tales of children that are intended to be a mirror reflecting a natural, inevitable, malevolent, and vicious self within each one of us. With such a low opinion of ourselves and our abilities to function in groups or societies, it makes sense that we could be further misled into thinking we must need some benevolent force amongst ourselves to curb ourselves. From this teaching, we are logically concluding that we need governance for our own good. One thing I like to point out when looking at the propagandized definition of anarchy versus the reality of not being ruled or having self-reliance is that anarchy isn't Mad Max. Anarchy is simply making a living without the state's intervention. It's making your own decisions. It's not being forced to do something by another person or an organization and usually for their opinion of your own good. And in specific examples we see today, homeschooling is anarchy. Farmers markets are anarchy. Paying cash to the neighbor's kid to mow your lawn is anarchy. Buying lemonade from the kid's stand down the street is anarchy. Most of the things that we think of as American values are actually anarchy. If he gets up, we'll all get up. It'll be anarchy. Don't forget to subscribe to the Anarcho Christian Podcast on whatever podcast you're using. If you're not sure where to find us, visit anarchochristian.com slash subscribe. There you'll find links to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Android, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider letting us know by leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes or wherever you catch the episodes. Also, like and share the episodes on Facebook or the other social media sites. You can support the show with a monthly donation through Patreon or Subscribestar, or a one-time donation through PayPal. You can visit us on those sites, or you can visit the Support the Show tab on anarchochristian.com. That will take you to a page where you'll find links to Patreon, Subscribestar, and PayPal. Thank you to Freeman Fundamentals for being our newest patron. I really appreciate your support. So I think that's it for today. Grace and peace. No King but Christ.
Thank you for listening to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast. Subscribe to our email notifications at anarchochristian.com. Like us on facebook.com backslash anarchochristian. And follow us on Twitter at anarchoxp. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube to join us next time as we continue to evaluate the relationship between the Christian and the state. No king but Christ. Gravely disappointed. Again, you have made me unleash my jokes of all. It'll be anarchy!